All right, welcome to another episode of Not Investment Advice. We've got the NAI boys here, caffeined up trunk fan with his uh, VC Bragg's merch. Double, loving double it. barrel shotgun Red Bull today, boys. <laughs> here we go. Not sponsored, but. Uh, <laughs> Not sponsored. Um, just uh, always the energy and we've got Jack Butcher founder of Visualize Value here as always with his uh, impressive merch as well on his <laughs> on his head and then we've got a special guest if you guys are listening not watching you're not seeing the amazing thing we're seeing on the screen right now which is bored Elon Musk on Twitter or bored as he's referred to um, bored how do you how do you introduce yourself man yeah, I go by board. Uh, for those who are are listening and not watching, I'm appearing today for the first time as a floating Wizard of the Oz <laughs> style head. Um, figured I would uh, join you guys in, in doing the video thing. But uh, yeah, I've been a, a pseudonymous Twitter account for the last eight years. Wow. I basically forked <laughs> I forked real Elon uh, back in 2013 <laughs> when he uh, came up with the idea for a Hyperloop, which is like this high speed train, and. Uh, this was something he just did in his downtime when he was kind of bored. And I thought that would be a cool character. Like what else does Elon think about when he's sitting on the toilet or in the shower and eight <laughs> years later, just been tweeting these ideas um, and grown a pretty big following and have uh, leveraged that to do a lot of interesting things, including appearing on shows as a, a virtual avatar. So thank well, you guys for having me. No, absolutely. What is the most viral thing that you tweeted as uh, bored? Oh man, I think it probably was one of my early ones, which was the food truck Ferris wheel. So uh, <laughs> imagine a Ferris wheel, but instead of carts, they're food trucks. And instead of having to like walk around this huge oh field and go God. to all these trucks, genius, they would that. just rotate. You know, you stand in line and the food trucks appear in front of you. Why should you have to walk to the to the food truck? That's bullshit. Get your fried Oreo. Uh, so let's how go. How far did this business opportunity get? How much money did you raise? Uh, who's involved? Was Guy Fieri involved? Tell us. Tell us more. It's, it's already a SPAC deal. Uh, I can't say anything more at this point, but I, I will say um, when, when real Elon has tweeted at the account, that's pretty much what melted the phone. He's, he's acknowledged it a couple of times that that really busted the, uh, the iPhone out of my hand. Yeah. Fair enough, man. Fair enough. Um, well, board, you're, you're teeing us up really nicely for meme of the week. So okay. uh, as you know, I know you listen to the show. We always got to keep the tradition going, especially with guests. So Trung has I'm a special one for I, us this I'm week. Sorry that, I'm sorry I had to do this two weeks in a row, people. So last week, meme of the week was Elon uh, bought 9.2% of uh, Twitter. This was on a Tuesday we recorded, and it turned out he joined the board. But as many of us listening probably know, he is no longer joining the board of Twitter. But here's a tweet he put up last week. This is Elon. Uh, it's a picture of that domino guy. You know, he puts down one domino and then you see what happens. So uh, the, the first domino says he sells zip two to compact for 305 mil. I think that was like 98. Uh, he walked away 20 mil. And then ever since then, a lot of things have happened and it, it ended up with him acquiring uh, 9% of Twitter, which uh, leads to the end of the meme, which is uh, Twitter finally gets an edit button, which uh, Elon put a survey up. <laughs> but here's a plot twist, people. Plot twist. We all know who made that meme, boys. It was your <laughs> one and only Trunk Stunner. There it is. I posted it two days earlier. I like that you're hiding the, uh, no, the no, likes there and we retweets for now. Bro. There we go, buddy. <laughs> you look at that. <laughs> Bordy Long, I know you've been in the game. How do you how do you like that watermark there? For the listeners, yeah. I have a nice at Trunk T fan watermark on the meme. It's super, it's super smart. There's a lot of copy posters people on uh, on Twitter. So I appreciate what you did. Are you saying that Elon tweeted that photo with your watermark? Yeah, yeah. He took uh he definitely Amazing. so I uh I tweeted this meme out on the day that the, he, the news of him coming, uh, joining our, our purchasing Twitter came out. It was on Monday. I tagged him in it. I know he checks those tags every now and then. So he just sniped it and, and posted it on his own. You know, I, I'll throw a question to you, actually. People always, whenever Elon takes a meme, which is basically every meme that he posts is taken, right? And then there's this whole subsector of uh, 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 the media, which just loses their mind. Like, oh my God, he's a meme thief. I got to say, in the game of Twitter, getting sniped by Elon, that's like up there, man. Like that. That's like a, people are just dumping stuff in the replies on every one of his tweets, right? I guess ten thousand replies. They're all trying to get that. So I think that snipe is a badge of honor, and that's what you can put the watermark. So, board, well, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a badge of honor. It's not like you were getting paid for these memes, right? You're not like collecting royalties. So <laughs> if all you're winning is like uh, social social currency points, then that's then it. you're doing well. You you won that one. 
right, I'll accept that. You sent this in our Telegram, uh, the NI Telegram, uh, and uh, Jack was like, "You got to put that on chain, man. You got to put that I know, on man. chain." <laughs> You'll be I, uh, proved. I meant the memes now, Tron. Fiat fan, dude. I've left so much uh, uh, non-fiat on the table. It's embarrassing. You know, you know, if Jack had done that, butcher or Jack had done that, be a, a million dollars right there for Jack, right there. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so Just boys, for let's... preservation, provenance, you know, we're That's recording it. history. This will be like the front page of <laughs> the New York Times when Obama got elected in 50 years' time. The yeah, Trump exactly, fan right? meme on Twitter <laughs> joining, Elon joining Twitter. Um, so, boys, let's uh, let people know what we're talking about today. We're, we're going to talk a little bit about as a follow up uh, to what you guys are talking about Elon not taking the board seat. Why that? why that is, um, and like a wider discussion on the state of Twitter as a platform. Uh, but our special guest, we're also gonna be talking about uh, crypto gaming and something you've just launched actually today, the day we're recording. Um, so this will be yesterday by the time you guys are listening to this. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about edge of the internet stuff as well in the world of crypto and Bitcoin Miami, give a little recap as well. Um, but why don't I throw it over to one of you two, uh, one of you three? W- what is going on with with Elon not taking the board seat, um, and and like, what do you think the master plan is here? I'm uh, bored. You want to give us a recap? I'm happy to give the master plan afterwards. I got a lot of thoughts on that. Oh man, okay. Uh, the the quick recap for me, but I think you'll you'll elaborate far better than I will, Trung. Uh, basically, a lot of public discourse between uh, the CEO of Twitter, Parag, and, and Elon. So he takes nine percent stake. There's a lot of uh, public uh, hand holding and hugging around uh, Elon joining the board officially. Um, in the in the uh, meanwhile, he is putting lots of polls on Twitter, some that are valuable questions for the uh, community, others that are clearly just trolling Twitter, the uh, the company that he now has a massive stake in. Um, and then uh, after the weekend, uh, there is an announcement and a letter that is shared from Parag uh, that that Elon will no longer be uh, on the board of, of Twitter, uh, and he has other things probably to, to focus on like rockets and, and cars. And so a lot of drama, a lot of behind the scenes conversations, and uh, we'll see where it goes. But the rumor is that Elon might be wanting to buy an even bigger stake in Twitter and that being on the board would have prohibited him from doing that. Hence the, uh, the reversal of the decision. That was a so really good recap. Great recap. <laughs> Trung, is this short or was this a shorter stint than your intern internship at was it Scotia <laughs> no, Bank? I, I, did, I did three months at Scotia, man. Oh wow. No, the, you were well the joke in. here was uh, the Saramucci, right? This is uh our uh when Saramucci was uh, ten days chief of staff for Trump. This is like a, a not even not even half a Saramucci. Uh I'll just add a couple more thoughts onto board's excellent recap there. A little bit more of a timeline. Uh, but I, li- I like how you frame it. The hand holding is like Parag's like, oh, so happy to have Elon on board. And then Jack's like, this is an amazing opportunity. These guys are going to make an amazing team. Uh, but yeah, so Saturday morning on the actual timeline, Elon was supposed to formally accept the board position uh, per the uh, message that uh, board alluded to while well, Parag posted the message he sent to his Twitter team uh, on Twitter on Sunday night. But it was on Saturday morning that Elon said, you know what? I'm not going to join uh, Twitter's board. Uh, he was, he did take a background check and apparently he did pass it. So that wasn't the issue, but weirdly Pereg included it in the message. You know, it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors. Uh, we don't know, re- like you said, we don't really know what's going on, but here's what's funny. All those like polls you alluded to and mentioned like, uh, uh, well, I'll put up the most famous one. The one that probably got him in the most trouble with the, with the team. He asked, should uh, uh, delete the W in Twitter. Jesus so, <laughs> so for the listeners, I went ahead and did some Photoshopping. So here is what Twitter's logo looks like <laughs> with the word W in it. And here is what Twitter's logo looks like Without the word W. <laughs> I just see, wait, wait, can we zoom in on Jack's face? Cause the, the master designer is <laughs> looking- Baseline. Is that wait, the baseline shift? Wait, wait, <laughs> wait, Jack, hold on. Hold on, what is wrong with the, can you can you walk through mechanically? What is wrong with this Photoshop of Twitter to the word that I cannot pronounce? Cause I don't want to get in trouble. All right, so Jack, walk us through. Twitter with the W, Twitter without the W. What did I do wrong here? <laughs> For the listeners only, because if you're watching this, you can see that it's completely bolstered up. <laughs> the space, the spacing obviously doesn't look even remotely close to 
real and the baseline <laughs> of the text the uh the, the t love, at the beginning of the word i love they use the real words like baseline <laughs> like i remember sending something to jack it, ages ago maybe it was a uh, like one of the clips we did or something and you were like um you're like yeah helvetica new or like you just said the font or whatever it was you're like yeah classic helvetica oh man Wait, the so jack, that if you design like, world. What? Like for Jack, right? Like you saw that you're like instant, yo, this easy Photoshop, baseline's off. This isn't even remotely close, people. Yeah, well, I mean, there are little keys you can hold down in uh, go in uh, Google Slides. Hold shift next time, trying to get a nice little aligned uh, move across the horizontal second. axis there. Let's fix it real time. All right, here we go. <laughs> Wait, shift. All right, hold on a second. All right, here we go. How does that yeah, look, now boys? Bring it. Now you want to you want to crop the right edge a little bit more. Crop this it. is ridiculous. All right, all right. Bring how it are we tighter. Looking? Yeah, right, and then it. shift over a bit more. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now stop. He's got the eye. Now that is clean right there. <laughs> That's a someone NFT that right now. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I just noticed the first T and the two middle T's are different, and that's on Twitter. I I didn't realize that before. I'm not into it. That's yeah, you're right. That might be. Up. I think that might be an old. Uh, I think it might be a Google image search by uh, Trung from probably like early 2000s. Yeah. That logo. That was an older I've one. Seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was I also one noticed you, you left the uh, the bird alone. I noticed that yeah. didn't add. You didn't add memory glands. Right. I, 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 I actually, wait, board. I actually was going to do that. This is, I mean, we're on the same page here. We, we operate on the same levels. Um, so I'll say, so that one got, uh, you know, quite a lot of pushback. I understand it's a little bit juvenile, if we're going to be honest. The other one was, uh, should we turn Twitter headquarters into homeless shelter? Jeff Bezos actually responded to that. Apparently they did the same thing in Amazon Seattle, but then, there's another one. That, I think he kept this one up. So those two got deleted. <laughs> those two, Elon never deletes tweets. So he deleted those two tweets. And then uh, the other one was, uh, is Twitter dying? Uh, you know, he looked at the top 10 accounts. It's like, nobody uses these, which is true. Uh, like Cristiano Ronaldo and Bieber aren't really tweeting a lot. Uh, very valid point. And then the last thing he brought up, which also was deleted, was uh, – uh, somebody put a chart of daily active users showing up going up into the right steadily. He's like, those are all bots. So he's just shitting all over the business. But the last, the, the, uh, to Parag's letter, the thing I think that brought all this up was specifically the letter says, as a board member, you have a fiduciary to shareholders and the company. And by like shitting all over it, it's like maybe not the best for shareholders. And it opens you up to shareholder lawsuits. So what's funny is Saturday morning, he's, Let's Parag know like, I'm not joining the board. And then through the rest of the day, he's just shitting nonstop on Twitter's product and the company. So that's just kind of the- uh, Ready for the hostile takeover, yeah? Game of Thrones okay, so style. Let me address uh, what a uh, board brought up about the, you know, now that he doesn't join Twitter's board, he had a standstill agreement. He agreed that he would not acquire more than 14.9% of the company, him or a group related to him, if he was on the board. So as board mentioned, if he is not on the board, that standstill agreement is out. And yesterday he actually filed on Monday that uh, he is open to buying more shares. But we got to go to, let me do a quick summary of Matt Levine from Bloomberg, who is just covered this to a T, right? So he broke down this morning what he thinks is next. He does not think Elon will purchase Twitter. And these are his reasons. So first of all, to purchase Twitter, Elon's going to have to spend 30 to $40 billion more. So his net worth is 250 plus. But a lot of that is tied up in Tesla stock. And a lot of his Tesla stock has already been pledged for other loan purposes. So the amount that he might have to raise more money is not actually, it, it would be very material, even at his wealth level, it would hit him. Um, he could team up with other investors like a Silver Lake, a big PE firm, which has already invested a billion to Twitter. Um, that could be in the cards, but, uh, Matt Levine says, why would these guys team up with uh, Elon in the sense of like, they're just gonna give him money and have zero control, right? It's not like they're teaming up with them and they're going to really have a say in anything. So these savvy investors might not do that. Uh, the other thing he brings up is maybe he'll team up with, uh, some people that have tried to acquire uh, Twitter in the past. Salesforce has, uh, Disney has, I don't see either of those happening. Uh, the last two things he added were debt. He could raise $40 billion in debt. However, a typical company, uh, a typical debt raise is six times EBITDA. 
uh, for the amount that they would need to raise for Twitter, it would be 600 times or 60 times EBITDA. So very unlikely. And then will he buy more? Matt Levine says at, at 9%, he's in like a Goldie's lock zone. Above 10%, you have to start making a lot of disclosures when you buy and sell stocks. So mm. it's a little bit less fun for Elon, it, right? Now, but like at 9%, he's the biggest shareholder at already the most influential user, gets to dick around and like do whatever he wants and uh, not have all these extra SEC uh, uh, things going on. So that's the take. Uh, from Matt, uh, who is the complete expert on it, so I'm just maybe he's trying out. to maybe he's just trying to bring it down further in price, so then he can just keep buying until he's ready when it's just worth ten times less. Well, and technically, then he, he then already goes... jumped at twenty percent. <laughs> yeah, oh, really? All right. All right. Um, anyway, so yeah, definitely interesting development from last week. Uh, we covered that quite a lot last week. If you're interested as well, um, uh, just moving over to to board. When we spoke before this, you talked about wanting to discuss the state of Twitter as a platform, and obviously, all three of you, especially, have used Twitter for your business, your personal writing, creative pursuits, and board. You're obviously now launching. Uh, you've just launched, announced the company today. And a lot of this is based on what you've done on Twitter. So curious to get your take on kind of the state of Twitter. Yeah, I mean, the state of Twitter today is um, both good and bad. I will say that I'm always a fan of the platform because it did give me the reach uh, and the uh, the creative outlet um, that I was able to build with this, with this uh, account. Um, and I will also give credit to the team for the last two years of really experimenting a lot. Things like Twitter spaces, adding different formats for media, Twitter blue, adding NFT integration, they're, they're breaking stuff fast and trying new things. I think that's on a tech level, really worth, worth celebrating and, and giving them, them kudos. Um, I think that what is really challenging um, is both uh, content sort of uh, control or cleanliness um, and then in sort of the algorithm. So on the, on the first front, um, there's a lot of bots, as Elon has pointed out, um, a lot of spammers. It's becoming very dangerous to navigate <laughs> the uh, the world of Twitter. It's like uh, walking on eggshells every time you want to click a link and not knowing what's going to happen. So that that's something that's out of control, and I'd like to see repaired soon. And then you know, on the algorithm front, it does feel like um, people who have built a large following. Um, you know, I'll, I'll include myself humbly in that in that uh, regard. Um, are suffering a little bit from people who actually have followed us not being able to see our content. I know Jack has has expressed this to some degree as well. Um, perhaps the top ten Twitter users that Elon pointed out who are not using the platform as much, maybe they're not doing it because it really doesn't have the reach that it used to. But yeah, there's like a weird recency bias uh, I think to the algorithm that is supporting. Um, people who are basically talking about the news, who are talking about sort of hot topics and trends, and it's less based on chronology um, and user opt-ins, you know, for, for those who have, have built a following. So it's a little disappointing, honestly, on my end to see um, users of Twitter not have more control over the content they see. I understand that it's a flood of information and, and Twitter's trying to create a, a, a smooth experience so that people are not overwhelmed with information. But if I'm a consumer, I definitely would love to just have more control over who, you know, what, what content I see. And if I'm following some, someone, making sure that I see their content and just have a bit more uh, access to that. So, yeah, if, if, uh, if what Elon has proposed in terms of like giving the, the power of algorithms back to users comes to life, I'll, I'll be really happy. So just a couple of takes there on Twitter. Yeah, I love that, man. Yeah, and just for people who don't follow you, which is um, probably not that many people listen to this podcast because you're definitely uh, a, someone who's very popular in our circles. You've got 1.7 million followers on, on Twitter, right? Um, did you ever um, do anything outside of Twitter or on Instagram or any other channels, email, stuff like that? Never, no. I mean, it started off uh, solely on Twitter, have tried to shift some of it away from Twitter because it's just good to distribute your, your reach, but it's hard, right? I mean, the idea of like owning your audience and being able to port it to another platform is really difficult. Like email is kind of the only way you can really do that. But as of today, um, I don't really own, I don't own that 1.7 million, you know, person following that's, that's Twitter's. And, uh, yeah, if they shut me down tomorrow, that, that stinks for me. That's my, my biggest sort of uh, mechanism for reaching people going away. I don't think that'll happen because I, I tend to be not very provocative. Uh, but 
it's, it's a little bit of a, of a stress point for me. So I, I would love to be able to, to migrate that following to other places over time. But as of now, I think just the type of content I share, it works really well on Twitter. And I think you guys see that with your content as well. Yeah, definitely. And Jack, I mean, we've talked about on the show the week it happened to Jack where some of his accounts got taken down. And Jack, do you remember how crazy that was? It took did it take a few weeks to get it back or it was, it was about yeah, it was about a week, something like that. But if I'd have you know, it only happened because somebody at Twitter was um following me and helped me out and my personal account didn't get wiped out. Because if that if that had gone as well. I think I'd have just been, you know, up shit creek without a paddle, as the uh, <laughs> saying goes. Well, it's because you but lost. No, you lost. Did you lose business at business? No, at value I had. Wh- who's got at value now? It's just banned. Charlie Munger. He's- yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imagine he was the one behind it all. That I, was the I con- heard Citadel Capital bought it. I, think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, it pops up Ken Griffin in a few months. Um, that was a, that was a hard loss, but the, um, yeah, the, it would have been a huge material impact. And like you say, board, like the format of Twitter is very different than email. Even if you can like port your email over, uh, port your audience over, like the way you compose content for different mediums doesn't necessarily, like, I'm not going to send a 80 character email 15 times a day <laughs> would be a little bit ridiculous. Bro, can you imagine? But- <laughs> maybe we can uh get that as a, didn't you, as a new you tried it on a t- didn't you try a text at one point jack as well yeah text is interesting but it is like quite invasive too like there's i think i'm all for like give me the option to turn off the algorithm it's like everybody i'm subscribed to i just want it chronological just blast yeah. me with it um because i always i often find this where there's people who i would assume i like in interact with their stuff a good amount and i go to their profile and i look it's like wow i didn't see any of this stuff from yeah a week two weeks whatever else like probably all three of you guys like your stuff isn't getting inserted into my feed when you post it and that's just it's bizarre which is and crazy because reasons. literally we're talking 50 times a day in dms yeah. and liking each other and stuff, tagging like, each other and stuff exactly. and it's bizarre it's really bizarre i think like you said the the stuff that is more like the stuff that is driving engagement platform wide is maybe the stuff that they're trying to like put in your feed more often. And, you know, every other thing is a suggestion or a, like, you know, I never thought about that. that. That's a great point board about, uh, this is why probably the meme accounts do so well, right? Because they're memeing on whatever the funny finance story is that morning. And, uh, and don't get me wrong. Like I'll jump a lot on these like meme stories, but, uh, it makes so much sense. Jack, for the record, VV and I mean, Jack butcher, all up in trunk fans feed man that uh, you are hit my feet hard bro good good good. (laughs) Um, glad to hear it well or board i I wanted to ask a little bit about the pseudonymous nature like of what you're doing so you've built this over eight years um obviously people don't know who you are in real person in in real life um could you tell us a little bit about that decision why you did that and why you stayed doing that um, because obviously within crypto, people listening to this have heard that concept is quite popular within crypto world. But to like a regular Joe on the street, they're like, what are you talking about? Why why would someone do that? So could right. you give us a little background on that? Yeah. So uh, pseudonymity, I heard that term first uh, shared by uh, Balaji Srinivasan. And I feel like it's like the academics version of uh, of anonymity. But the the core difference is that with pseudonymity, you have you have a reputation, right? So back in the day, hundreds of years ago, people would uh, would write books uh, with a pseudonym, and it wouldn't be their real name. And so over time, they developed this reputation, and that's kind of what I did as well. And I'll admit, it wasn't intentional, right? It started off as just like a parody account, kind of a joke. Let's see where this thing goes. Fast forward to maybe 2020, and I realized, okay, I have built up this this reputation anonymously, and it was really nice because. Um, living in the West coast, I think I've, I've publicly said that I live in Los Angeles. You see the downsides of, uh, of rich and famous, uh, being famous has a lot of downsides. You, you know, you basically have uh, a lot of scrutiny. Um, and, and the, and the worst part I think is that that scrutiny sometimes spills over to your friends, to your family and people around you get pulled into it. So I like this idea of pseudonymity for that reason. I also like the idea of it, um, 
to not necessarily have people judge me based on my background, my, my skill sets, where I've worked, what I've done. Um, the idea of sort of like meritocracy, like people can judge me purely based on my thoughts and my actions. And I do have a reputation to lose. Like I'm not uncancelable. If I'm an asshole on Twitter, people can stop following me and they can stop, you know, spending the money on, on businesses that I support. So I do have something to lose, but as I sort of learned more about the, the pseudonymous economy, um, and also looked at bad things that were happening by anonymous individuals, I thought to myself, okay, I need to set a good example of how somebody can operate a business, who can invest, who can partner, um, who can be ethical, who can be transparent and show the world that, hey, like not everybody who operates this way is 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 got nefarious intentions. So I'm trying to, to set that, that tone and I hope other people follow because I, I believe like we we have the right to sort of compartmentalize our identities, right? Like you can be a lawyer during the day. And if you're super into music or art or video games or whatever it might be, you can create another character. And that, that character can focus on those other things you like. Like you don't have to bring your entire self to every genre or interest area that, that you want to participate in. So I think there's a lot of upside. Um, and, and, and the conversation around like, you know, being a non, so you can just get away with illegal things. I want to diminish that because I think most people given the opportunity to do this, they will, they will do the good things. They will, they will use it for good, not use it to, you know, scam people or, or do things that are inappropriate. So, yeah. What, what are the downsides? I love that you wrapped up the kind of the, uh, how you treated it and the, the upside of it, right? What, what would you say the downsides are in your opinion of your approach? I mean, definitely like explaining this to your parents is weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so a... how, have you explained it to them or you don't even bother? Kinda. I mean, they're, you know, they're like, uh, you know, first generation immigrants. Like they're like, this is, this is weird. I, I don't get it, but whatever you do, you, um, very few people in my, in my family, like even know about this. I'd say there's 50 people who basically know that I'm on board Elon. Um, but downsides, honestly, not that much. Um, I think a couple of years ago doing things like raising money for a startup, um, you know, doing like partnerships, any kind of business deals was a lot harder as a pseudonym today, especially with what's happening in web three with so many people operating this way. Nobody cares really, uh, if you, if you're a pseudonym or not. So there's not a lot of downsides at this point. Um, I think the, the biggest sort of like fear at this point is the secret being spoiled. Um, I don't have anything to hide. I just think it's cool when nobody knows who Bordelon is. And it's kind of like, you know, Banksy, right? You don't want to know who Banksy is. He's probably some nerd. It'll be like really lame once we find out who, who Banksy is. So be I want to keep the right? Out. Like you're just yeah, like- Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's probably you, Trung. No offense. I mean, like, it's, it's, <laughs> it, you don't need to know. Like the magic is, is just, is there when you don't know. So I'm, I'm trying to protect it. Um, I hired a security firm to try to crack it. Like I just said, Hey, really? go find out who board Elon is Yo! and they couldn't do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No way. I don't wow. want to provoke anybody, but like I, you know, so far so good, but I think I got a couple years of, uh, preserving my ID and uh, I'm going to have fun with it. Will you ever unmask yourself willingly? And under what circumstance would that happen? Will it happen live on the NIA podcast? Will it happen right now? <laughs> is what I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do the motion. I, I don't have hands in this avatar, but I was going to like rip the mask to the side, like <laughs> Mission Impossible style. Um, I, in my head, the only way I would do it is if, uh, if real Elon asks, and then I'd be like, all right, cool. You've been a good sport. I'll do it for you. But uh, no, I don't see any reason to unveil who I am at this point. I think it's fun. Can I play 10 <laughs> questions? Like, can you give me some, will you play breadcrumb trails with me? Or are you just saying trunk fuck off? <laughs> I'll do it. I mean, I can always not answer, but I'm okay. Down. All right. So you're in California or you've been in and around the West coast. Is this correct? That is correct. Or are you Vietnamese? <laughs> I'm not going to go into a, into racial identity or is uh, Trump talking are to you himself a 37 right year old now? Vietnamese with a son that lives in Vancouver, BC. <laughs> who, who has a David Bowie book on yeah. your shelf. <laughs> Check out that sign LeBron and, thing too, man. Oh my goodness. And a clock that doesn't change the time. Yeah. The it with no battery. But it's right, but it's right twice a day. Okay, yeah. let me speaking of twice, let me add uh uh one comment and one quote. They're both comments. I just wanted to sound cool. All right, so to what board's been up to. Uh it hasn't, you know, there used to be a time when this is quite prominent. I think you mentioned it briefly, but I think I'll, I'll bring up a really famous example. Benjamin Franklin 
used to write under the name Mrs. Silence Dogwood. <laughs> so the uh, pseudonymity uh, during uh, 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 the American Revolutionary times was very popular. And just like you explained, Board, you could build a reputation through your writing, right? With these pamphlets that they did. Uh, so that was always an interesting example. And then to your point about uh, the downside of uh, being quote unquote known and famous, it can affect your family and things of that nature. This is an amazing Bill Murray quote. Bill Murray says, I always want to say to people who want to be rich and famous, try being rich first. <laughs> so that's just a beautifully <laughs> put, right? Like, listen, I get that fame can lead to riches, but if you can just have one, just get rich. That's pretty smart. I like that. So I'm done. That's me. That's my two thoughts. <laughs> well, I was going to ask, uh, thanks for sharing all that board. I'm curious to ask Jack and Trunk, who are both have built your Twitter, you know, following whatever you want to call it, very much on your own names with Jack. I mean, though Jack actually started with Visualized Value first, right? So that was a brand. It wasn't, I don't know if you consciously in the beginning were not trying to show who you were as a person and later felt more comfortable or decided to do that. Um, yeah, actually, let's do you first and now I'd love to get Trunks take as well. Yeah, the, the, the name actually came originally from the basically the agency playbook where it's like you're trying to create something bigger than yourself so when you're like interacting with businesses at size it's not like they're paying a freelancer they're like engaging a company so it's part of that, that. And part Love like that. positioning it as a brand bigger than me and then um i think over time like it gave it definitely when i started to move into like building education products i was a part of the product so it's like, it makes sense to like build up the relationship between the two entities. So people, um, I mean, I think that's like a huge component of trust, even with a pseudonymous character versus like a faceless brand, right? Whether it's your real name or like a, uh, a pseudonym, there is like a greater connection formed between like people than there is like company and individual. So just having operated in the social space for a while, like that was a big unlock as well. Just you get, you make better connections that way too. And like made a lot of good friends through my name. Not so much. Like if you look at the visualized value inbox on Twitter, it's wasteland versus like, you know, put your personal <laughs> inbox yeah, where yeah, people yeah, like you. treat you like a human being. So it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. And, and I think it's niche enough where like, you know, nobody's come and take pictures of you outside your house. You're a yeah. little like, you got a little Twitter account versus, you know, you're producing hit records or something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, and Trunk, what about you, mate? Because yours is straight up Trunk with his with his kid walking, walking with your kid. Just, just went for it. I actually, I'll be honest with you, uh, we'll probably be familiar with this, but in Naval's famous thread, you know, like how to get rich without getting lucky, he, there's one tweet is like, Oprah, put her name on it. Trump put her name on it. Right. It's like, whatever you think about Trump or Oprah, uh, it's like you put your name on it, you get all the downside, but you get all the upside. Right. It's yeah. Like, that's a good it's way like, to put it. If you assign, if you put it out to the world that you're willing to take the risk, they will give you all the upside on that. But then because they're recognizing that you're taking the risk, I actually never even came to my mind to do what board did. And I think a lot of that though was like, I think I had the personality to be like, like I thought that my best way to, if, okay let's just work with the premise that you care about some level of notoriety or fame, right? Let's say that all things equal, you can turn that into something positive, which clearly like board has turned a large audience into many opportunities. Right. And for myself, I've, I've been able to grow an audience and take those to go different opportunities. So there clearly is upside um, to Jack's point, not nearly, you know, there goes a point where if you're like Kevin Hart, you can't even walk down the street, right? That like, nobody wants that. Like that is absurd. But uh yeah, it never it never even uh, struck me to do what board's doing. I just said, you know what, uh, Naval's thing of like just put risk on your name. Like I, I totally got that. I'm like, yeah, cool, I'll do it, and we'll see what happens. And yeah. it can all go down in flames, right? We know that. We can, and uh, and unlike board, uh, if it goes down in flames, <laughs> wait, 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 it's gonna be. Wait, it's gonna well, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Wait, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go into that a bit more. There, this is gonna turn into a therapy session now. So, no, but it's like, well, it's like you said, right? It's like once you put your name on, it's like that's why that's why you get the the uh, the upside is because yeah. if it goes down. 
<laughs> you're getting the yeah. downside yeah 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 no but yeah if anyone leaked uh, the the private dms or whatever then you'd be uh, hey, not in just me man for anyone <laughs> Everyone, in the world yeah. right of course of course you just make yourself uncancelable trung you just have to tweet that stuff straight <laughs> out <laughs> just go for it yeah, no, that's true, right? fragile strategy just go for it and just take the uh, like take the like take the joe rogan blow that he took like he just t- recently took right he just took it and like at the end of all that stuff that we talked about many weeks ago where they tried to straight up cancel joe rogan the end result is they just put a blue covid banner on top of all his podcasts now he's still joe rogan yeah joe rogan just like yo for like for everybody else joe rogan took the bullet man but yeah it sounds like bought i mean i just objectively speaking from my point of view not saying one's better or worse I, I only started like getting into the pseudonymous stuff when I also heard biology talk about it. And, and I never uh, thought about, about it. Diff- what about yeah. bling bling king? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was, per- well, no, all jokes aside though, I was gonna, this is kind of a joke, but also true. So don't judge me as a 16 year old. I used to do exactly what Jack was saying. I was 16, I'm insecure about being 16, right? I'm calling a supplier in China and they're like, who's this kid? So I needed to make something bigger than me, whatever brand that was. But then on my emails to customer service, I would change the name, who it was signed from, pretend I was like, oh, totally. like I had stuff. So I'm- Did you play your own like executive assistant too? Yeah. No, 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 I never did that, no, 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 I never did. It was no. just like matching the name, like if it was like a nice, English white name, I would give that like John Stones guy, or if Dorothy. it was like someone Patel, then I'll just make sure they know I've got a little love for the for the brown people. Just it was just you got little wins, you know. That's what you gotta do. But um, yeah, go on. No, I was just gonna say I love how Bilal's like, oh, I can't tell them that my name is Bilal Zadie. I didn't need to come up with a really professional sounding brand. Bling bling Emporium. <laughs> Empor- I love the word Emporium as well. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, back to my earlier point, though, I think you don't necessarily have to pick. Like, if you put yourself out there, that is a decision you made. But tomorrow, you guys could create accounts that are that are not your names, right? You could basically fork yourself, go in, go all in on like some other topic that nobody knows you for. And if it doesn't work out, burn it and start over again. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's hard is like once you put enough time and grow a following, that that is something that is established. But yeah, it's not all or nothing. Like, and I, and I think that for uh, a lot of people who want to go about, uh, trying creative exercises, whether they want to be a writer, musician, whatever it is, if they come from an industry where they're afraid of putting themselves out there and looking stupid, um, a pseudonym is a really good way to just practice in public and have a playground where you don't feel like you're going to be judged by your employer, by your family members or whatever it might be. Um, again, especially if it's like not expected of the, of the, of the type of person you are. So that's the number one reason I think that I encourage people to try pseudonymity is like, it just gives you the bravery to try things and not worry about looking stupid. Yeah. Uh, I love that. I, I think it would be a great that. experiment to run that as well. The three of us should do that for six months and come total- back and, and do <laughs> a reveal. Yeah. Well, I was going to say trunk. I know you post obviously a bunch of memes, right? A lot of the time. And I've, we've probably talked about on the show before, but there's certain accounts that are, you know, like the pseudonymous funny accounts, um, you know, board you're in that group as well, posting jokes and funny ideas and stuff like that. But I'm thinking of like Parikh Patel, John Rich, who actually, uh, John Rich is the writer, whoever's behind that has Tony actually- Light. yeah, he's come yeah, out. He's, he's come out as, and he writes like kind of serious threads actually is quite funny uh um on his on his like personal account yeah yeah he seems super smart and interesting but yeah i mean as someone who's making jokes do you feel like you'll just get away with so much more if it wasn't on your own name though right oh there's no question there's no question the the line is much further look at some of the stuff our boy patel just throws (laughs) out there like going straight up like i i I like uh i do draw the line like i'm not going after politicians and like things i i i don't I, I'm much less like uh, uh, ho- hostile and not to say that they're necessarily hostile, but like, I'm not really good. I'm punching really far up. Right. Like I'm making like jokes about Jeff Bezos, like Jeff Bezos has, will never know who I am. Right. He will never even like for a millisecond of my life. But like when you all get to be these anonymous accounts, you, you're not punching all the way up there. You're getting a little bit closer to like, you know, in and around like what your status might be. And uh, I, I won't do that type of stuff. I'll try to try not to. It's a bit of the uh, Jerry Seinfeld shtick. Uh, I don't know if you know about Seinfeld, but he refuses to curse in his standup because he says cursing is a cheat code. 
because when you curse in a stand up, it's like you say the F word, it like makes people laugh, right? It's like, it's just like, oh, this guy's so out of control. Seinfeld's like, I refuse to curse because it's a lot harder to get a laugh. And he's such a purist. He's like, if I can make you laugh without cursing, that to me is more, way more difficult. And like, that's the challenge I want for myself. Uh, not to say that, that, that these anonymous accounts are like doing the easy thing, but I think sometimes just straight up, just making fun of everybody and everything, like no matter where they are punching near you or down, it's like, that's, uh, uh, that's something that I will not, or I can't really do No, to, to be honest. It's like, if I get called out of it, I just don't want to deal with it. Yeah. I mean, you're literally wearing the VC Braggs hat, right? I think they're a great example. I, I, I say there because I've heard it's more than one person, but it, it might not be. Um, so, like, that's a great example. If you've never seen VC Braggs on Twitter, like, they will call out when VCs are saying ridiculous stuff, which happens yeah. all the time because a lot of VCs are ridiculous people. Um, <laughs> so, like, when, uh, what's his name? The, uh, the dude who's in Miami who has the best, the best ever, the worst takes in the world. Oh boy. Raboy, yeah, it's exactly. I mean, there are many, he he actually has amazing takes. He just does not. He's oh. t- he does not care how he delivers it. Yeah, no, I mean, he's incredible. I'm sure he's one of the smartest people around, and uh, incredibly impressive. And I'm, he knows what he's doing. But some of the stuff he says is insane, right? Like he has an amazing line. He's, he he says basically about any category. He goes, "I've forgotten more about topic X than you've ever learned in your entire that's, life." That's pretty funny. That's Kanye <laughs> like, like, Bar, man. That's a Kanye yeah, yeah, Bar. Yeah. 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 So, there you go. <laughs> Um, anyways, uh, yeah, uh, the last thing I'll say, is I do think for comedy specifically, it's an amazing tool to be able to write as a character. And, that, you know, obviously a lot of comedians do that, in, even in their stand-up or, or like stuff they create. So, um, yeah, I can definitely see that working. So, Bord, uh, not to get too off track, let's talk a little bit about what you're working on right now because you've just launched Bored Box um and you're it's it's in the world of crypto gaming i don't know that much about this world so what 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 did you launch today yeah well first of all i'll give uh, a little bit of a primer just to kind of uh explain why i have a background and 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 feel confident in, in launching a business like this but um i worked in video games for 10 years so add that to the list of uh clues trung trying to figure out who i am we're, we're out in uh, you, boy. On, <laughs> i've designed a few games worked on launching really well known ip Um, And so I've watched the video game industry and how it's transitioned from kind of the traditional, like buy a cartridge or a CD, play a game, go on to the next one to free to play games like Fortnite, where you spend no money and then you end up loving it. And uh, you end up buying lots of digital stuff in those games to where we are today, which is people are building what I'm referring to as blockchain games, where essentially you basically can own uh, digital assets in games. So if you think about the average video game player who's investing tons of time and money into games, into assets that they can they can use in those games, that person doesn't really own that stuff, right? The same way that you don't necessarily own your Twitter account, like it's a platform that owns it, um, people don't own their stuff in video games. So like I'll use a, a personal example. There's a card game called Hearthstone, similar to like Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, I've spent probably over a thousand dollars buying cards for that game. And if I delete that app tomorrow, that money is all gone, right? Like I had a good time playing it, but it's not really mine. So the future, at least my, my estimation, the future of video games is that not only are you going to be like downloading digital files to play games, but you're going to be owning all of the items, the weapons, the land, the characters in those games as well. That'll be your property the same way, like a Rolex on your arm is property or a hoodie or a VC brags, you know, hat. So board box essentially is taking the model of a product that used to exist, which is called loot crate, where basically you get sent a bunch of cool stuff that you might enjoy, like a swag box, kind of a surprise box. Um, and it's applying that to the world of blockchain gaming. So what we're going to be doing is working with blockchain gaming studios, assembling really awesome in-game assets, putting them in a digital box and basically providing a sample for people who are really interested in games, but don't have a lot of time to go searching for what they want to play. And we're going to do these drops throughout the year. And so the perfect kind of customer, if I'm going to call them that, is somebody who is familiar with crypto, likes video games, and doesn't have a lot of time. And they basically want to spend more time playing games and not just hunting for what they should play. And so I'm taking my background in in video games and, and the understanding I have of the space as a game developer and designer and basically acting as the curator. So yeah, we, we launched it today. Uh, there's a lot of details that we're going to share, but we, uh, we put it out there and, you know, aside from the business itself, it's, it's cool. Even to me, um, 
that I, I basically am launching this company as a pseudonym. My co-founder is a pseudonym. We raised money as a pseudonym. Um, and we're banking off the fact that people will trust me enough that I have built up enough of a reputation to run this business and for people to spend money with us. So uh, again, breaking, not just using this avatar for the first time on the NIA podcast, but uh, sharing sharing board box for the first time as well with you guys. Love it, man. And and board, before, before you did the game, were there other things business-wise that you've done using... Um, the pseudonymous account like were you investing or something like that i think i remember seeing you a lot of a lot of angel investing and a lot of it honestly came down not to research but friends of mine on the internet who have done the vetting telling me hey you should put money into this thing and then i did it (laughs) a lot of a lot of startups need reach more than they need money right so like if i'm cutting angel checks to startups they're a lot more interested in me being on the balance on the on the cap table in case i can like promote you know their their product uh, I, I had this uh, line a few months ago, like I don't have as much money as Andreessen Horowitz, but I have more followers than their Twitter account. And so yeah. a lot of investing as a pseudonym, I will say that generally speaking, you know, if you want to invest uh, anonymously or pseudonymously, like you still kind of have to dox yourself to put your, your legal name on a contract in America, you got to have somebody to sue, unfortunately. So I'm very careful about who I invest in and I build trust first, but yeah, I definitely have been conducting business uh, as this, as this entity. And your your investors in Boardbox know who you are, yeah? They do, yeah. There there was a a background check which I fortunately passed, and and uh, just like Elon, they, just like the real Elon. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah, you know the decision to invest was made before, but they they have, they did have to make sure that I wasn't a serial killer. Before can I the check can was I invest cleared. in Boardbox now? I want to find out who you are, man. <laughs> <laughs> we are not raising money. No, I'm sorry, right. but uh, you know maybe someday you'll figure it out. I, I got some <laughs> questions about your gaming background and Web3 gaming. So in the past, we have talked about Axie specifically, Axie Infinity, the play-to-earn game. Um, how much of the games that you'll be vetting, or are all the games you're picking Web3 related because of the ownership element? That's You're going to find all Web3 games? They are. And it's very okay. early days. There aren't a ton of games out there. But okay. yeah, that's the idea. And every box is going to have five games in it. So the goal for us is like, I want to vet a hundred games so that we can pick five. So it's truly curation. Okay. So l- let me actually, before we get into the Axie Web3 world, let me ask you some questions about the previous world. In 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 the world you've existed in and worked in, could you give us like, first of all, what is your favorite game? What is the canon of games uh, from the 2000s that you're just like, this is the greatest piece of gaming ever created? Like, let us get into your mind a bit about what you think a great game is. So personally, I grew up on Japanese RPGs. Uh, think Final Fantasy, Chrono Gears, Chrono Trigger, which was recently remade, Chrono Cross rather. So I love those games. I unfortunately don't have 300 hours anymore to put into like playing an RPG. Yeah. So if I want to just sit down and play a quick game, I'm doing something like Rocket League. It's like 10, 15 minutes. It's soccer. It's cars with rocket boosters. Can't go wrong. I think the greatest game for me of all time I'm going to put up there uh, is uh, is Zelda uh, Breath of the Wild. I think it's just a beautiful game. Um, so I definitely like single player kind of solo narrative driven experiences okay. more than what a lot of other people like, which is like, Call of Duty, you know, Fortnite. I'm not into first person shooters. Um, yeah. And so I, I see, I see uh, for, you know, kind of the web three world, you do need more multiplayer experiences. Like the solo games don't, don't translate very well to, to web three, but they're still going to get made. And that makes me excited. Well, why? Uh, because there is a community element, right? Like the ownership and like all the sharing that you're seeing with the NFT world. Like if you're not doing that, for uh, Web3 games. This is like, well, give us an example. What would a first person shooter look like in the Web3 world? What are you getting extra from there? Yeah, I mean, you can reverse engineer games that exist today, like say Fortnite, for example, right? You're buying skins. And the thing that Fortnite mastered is it was all based on aesthetics. So the, the big problem in the past with like building an economy in video games was this idea of pay to pay to win, right? Like if I spend more money, I can get this beefed up player and I can just come in, put no effort in and just beat everybody. And that's super frustrating. That actually destroys the game mechanics. Now, Fortnite just said, no, 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 you can't do that, but you can, you can buy a skin and make yourself look like this awesome character. So it's purely aesthetic. And that's really where um, the very like simplest explanation for why, why blockchain gaming is going to work like status, status, you know, uh, seeking is really important. And so back to like the previous question, why, 
um, you know, why is multiplayer going to work more for web three games than solo player? Cause you need to be able to show off. If I'm playing a game by myself, I don't have anybody to show off to, but if I'm playing with 10,000 other people, then I have a reason to spend money on this thing that makes me look cool. So for an RPG to work, you would have to have such just like massive game. I mean, they've tried it in the past, right? Like a lot of these games have tried massive online role-playing games, right? It's like pretty similar. Like, uh, yeah. well, what are the best examples? World of Warcraft, yeah, Final World Fantasy Warcraft. 15. Yeah, absolutely. So it's sort of like an RPG meets a multiplayer game that works really well. The only way I can see uh, blockchain applying to like solo player games is proof of accomplishment. So like, if you go on like, reddit gaming you'll see people doing crazy shit in one player games like they beat a boss in a really interesting way they speed run if there's a way to document you accomplishing something in a solo game uh and then proving that it was you and sharing that you were the only person in the world who did that i think that's an interesting use case for 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 blockchain i don't think it's a very profitable one but it's a it's an interesting one to explore um, but can I can I ask a quick ahead. question there? Uh, do you think there are any Web three games right now that can compete with the the traditional gaming world so far in terms of how you define a good game? You know, enjoyment level, like community, whatever you want to uh, call it. There, um, just because we've talked about Axie a few times before, I've never actually played Axie, but um, that's obviously been it seems like the most popular Web three game so far in terms of volume at least and number of users um so i'm just curious from what you're seeing out there are, are you actually seeing games that you think can compete even today or is this going to be longer term they're going to reinvent the way that we've created all these amazing games in the past but with web3 use cases and rails I think by the end of this year and definitely in 2023, there are a lot of game, games that are being developed right now that some I've invested in that I think will absolutely compete. The reality is, is like there's good games and bad games everywhere. I mean, the Steam platform where you know people can play PC games and download PC games, they get 10,000 new releases per week, a lot of games. And I bet you most of them are not good. So I always kind of ruffle my brow a little bit when, when, when people talk about like, you know, our games, fun, our blockchain games fun, are they good? I mean, most games are bad. That's the reality. Most board games are bad. Most video games are bad. The so ones most, we hear about are the Most apps ones. are bad as well, right? Most and apps the, are bad. Yeah. Like 1% of apps even get used. So the reality is that the amount of games uh, that are built on chain is just very low right now. And once more get produced, the 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 quality ones will rise to the top but it's it's still pretty early and then just one uh, other follow-up because i know trunk just had a, another question to ask um we've noticed that there's been kind of like a backlash from a lot of again traditional the traditional gaming community i don't know if, if that's the right phrase but uh for example when was it discord was announcing nft integration or some sort of like web3 stuff they announced it and then people rallied against it and then they had to kind of like retreat. Um, so I'm curious, like, have you seen that? Is that just an anecdote or is that actually something you're seeing as well? And what needs to happen to change that culture? I think that sentiment is definitely overblown. Um, two weeks ago, I went to GDC, which is the games developer, game developers conference. And I would say that 80% of the people there who are actively building video games are either neutral or open to blockchain gaming. Mm, so I don't think that I don't think that that vocal minority is representative of all gamers, but I do respect the criticism. And I think the one that is the most valid is that if you build a game that allows people uh, to overwhelm the overall gameplay because they are simply there to monetize and extract value, that will ruin the game. So I think that it's on the game designers to make sure that when they're building blockchain games, they can be played entirely for free and that doesn't destroy the experience and that people who do want to make money uh, aren't getting in the way. Um, I, I think that, that that proposition is still is still being worked on. I don't think it should be dismissed entirely. We should stop building blockchain games and, they, and that AAA publisher should shy away from it, but they have to approach it really carefully and just, again, make sure that they don't ruin the, the fun that is already happening for those who don't want to drop thousands of dollars on NFTs. Well, what's the best way to invest in crypto games as a category i know this show is called not investment advice but just asking selfishly because i've seen like enough smart people i i um um you know trust or like respect at least that have talked about this space and i don't know enough about it but if i wanted to invest somewhere where would someone even get exposure to something like that 
I think that most uh, VCs are built are, are investing in the rails, like the technology that's going to help game developers make their games. Traditionally, uh, trying to make money in video games or any kind of games was really risky. It's hard to make the calls. It's like movies, right? Like some are going to be duds and some are going to be bangers. Um, but I think today, if you're kind of the individual investor, uh, and this is not investment advice, uh, do your own research, as Jack's hat says. <laughs> um, I would, I would, I would buy digital assets, uh, in games that are being built by experienced game developers, like people who have made games before they've been successful. They know what they're talking about. If a crypto bro says, I want to make a game and they raise a bunch of money and they've never made a game before, I'd be wary in that. Um, it's yeah. really hard to make a fun game. I, again, not to dox myself too much. I, uh, I developed a, a tabletop game and spent like six months on a card game, trying to get one game mechanic, right. And then I just threw it all away and started over. It's really, really hard. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I would say that that's a starting point, but if you're going to invest, uh, and you don't know too much about gaming and game development, it's, it's a risky vertical. I, I yeah, like fair. that idea of buying uh, like a, a artifact or NFT from that game. Would you liken it to like actually like a share ownership? Is like because by owning that piece of uh, of digital uh, the asset, right? It's like you're betting on the popularity of that game. That's all effectively like owning a share in a way, right? Mm -hmm. In a way, yeah. I mean, if you guys have ever used Kickstarter, like, you know, you can back people who are making games, right? And so the dynamic there is somebody pitches you a game and then you 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 donate to their cause. And then in exchange, you get the game, you get some swag, you get some items that basically represent that game. So this is kind of the next stage of Kickstarter where you're helping buy digital assets that are help fueling the development of a game. And then, yeah, you actually own something in that game. Um, is that an actual piece of equity in that game? That's not for me to decide or claim. Um, but you do own something. It is, it yeah. is a lot more tangible than just like a promise that you're going to get a product in the future. All right. So two follow-up questions. First is what is the greatest board game ever? Oh, get man. in the real questions. Yeah. I got to get it in bro. <laughs> I'm going to get judged by saying what I, what came to mind first. So I'm not going to say it now. Monopoly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Monopoly <laughs> is, is uh, broken mechanic. Like, the game mechanics are not good for Monopoly or Risk. I tell you, yeah, right definitely now. a lot of families yeah, have been yeah. broken up because of Monopoly. So, sure. so I'll say this. So I say every. I think the best games are a good combination of luck and strategy, right? So like chess is all strategy. There's really all information is on the table. And then pure luck is basically like shoots and ladders Monopoly. So what's in the middle is poker. A little bit of luck. You don't know what cards you're going to get and then strategy and trying to like outwit people. So I think I'm, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with my original gut instinct and just say settlers of Catan. I, was like, I, knew, not, it. I knew it. I know, man. Oh, I know. I know I'm going to be judged, but not because it's necessarily the best game, but I think that settlers of Catan introduced people to true tabletop gaming and in it, in it, and it sort of expanded everyone's horizon beyond monopoly and games like that, that are actually like quantifiably terrible. So I'll, I'll give it credit. It, it expanded the market for sure. That's interesting. Um, I love, I do love that answer, but so my, my follow-up, I'd love, uh, for Jack to, to hit you with some gaming questions after was, uh, can you talk about Axie? Um, so Axie Infinity, I'll just do the TLDR for the listeners and viewers that aren't fully familiar, a play to earn game. Uh, you had to spend basically a thousand dollars to enter the game uh, by buying NFTs. Um, the, the, the game itself has gone through a lot of ups and downs. Uh, recently, $600 million uh, worth of ETH was taken from a side chain uh, from the game. We took a uh, Ronin network, or we talked about two weeks ago. It, it looks like the game itself the, will reimburse a lot of that money. Uh, but the question is, so everything that's happened with uh, Axie Infinity can you tell us if that's a setback for Web3 or what the lessons are uh, for you looking at other games and, and, and your feeling? Because you're, you're building that space. Uh, that's the big dog in the space right now, right? That's the big Web3 game. So what has that done to affect or in your perception uh, change the playing field? I think the biggest fear for me, and this is not really on Axie, but they they had a security issue and $600 million was hacked and basically removed from their their particular side chain called Ronin. Um, the problem with that is that I think that's just going to have a lot of, that's going to create a lot more scrutiny for blockchain gaming in general, right? Like you've got this pretty, pretty terrible instance of consumers getting, you know, 
uh, losing funds, being defrauded, whatever you want to call it. And now there's a reason for certain people in Washington, D.C. and all over the world, really, to point to this and say, hey, this is gambling. Uh, you know, we need to heavily regulate blockchain gaming the same way we regulate cas- you know, casinos and anything else. So that's that's a downside. Um, if I'm if I'm giving kudos to, to that team, you know, they 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 helped kind of create the interest in blockchain chain gaming. Like they are the big dog. They brought millions of people into the space. They onboarded millions of people into web three. They encouraged people to like download MetaMask, learn how to buy crypto. Um, whether or not this was the best game, you know, people can debate that, but I think they're, they're owed credit. And in the end, I don't think this is going to stop what's already happening with the transition to blockchain gaming. I think, think it's going to be a setback. And my hope is that it basically just is a reminder for all other game studios to make sure that security is, you know, top of top of the line, um, and that we're going to have to work through more, uh, you know, we're going to have to think through all the regulations that are going to be thrown at the industry. So it's a setback for sure, but you're not going to stop people from building and playing video games. Like it's it's a pretty big deal. Something you mentioned earlier was that uh, you don't think that a good Web3 game, or not good Web3, Web3 game should be charging people, right, to touch the play. Because yeah. a big criticism of this was that two-thirds of the players were from the Philippines, from emerging markets, from uh, uh, lower-income economies. Uh, they relied on the game to make money, and it basically turned into a job. But then the game itself, uh, and the, economies, the economics of it in recent months has basically been, this is no longer better than working any job in the Philippines, right? So, like... That's probably something that you wouldn't want to see in other games where like this, where just to play, you have to put up money. Yeah. I mean, I think people basically decide they they can spend money or they can spend time. And effectively, that's just a translation of the same currency. So in the Philippines, they were trading to time and getting value out of it. And I think that's fine. Um, you know, if you don't have a lot of time to spend and you just want to like throw down cash and get some access to a game, that's cool too. And I, I mean, that, that isn't, that isn't unique to web three. I mean, there are people who, who spend thousands of dollars on, on mobile apps because they just want to like level up their characters quickly. Um, so yeah, I, I think everybody can make that individual decision, but it is, it is a little heartbreaking when you see people who are in, um, you know, emerging uh, economies losing thousands of dollars that would have paid for, you know, a years of uh, food or their homes or whatever it might be. And so it's a reminder that like, we're going to have to continue building systems that, that protect consumers. And I would, I would, I would stress that the industry itself should be focused on that versus regulators who don't really have a, a deep understanding of crypto. Yeah. Um, Jack, I don't know if you had any questions, if you do, yeah, I was, just gonna ask about, I was just going to ask about the, um, well, actually, I was going to preface it with a, te- uh, a tweet I shared in our group chat earlier this morning that said, uh, men will literally ignore the fact that staking rewards and yields are just marketing expenses tied to unsustainable <laughs> unit economics instead of going to therapy, <laughs> which I think Brilliant. is like an interesting... Yeah, rolls off the tongue there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just like when you talk about all of these things, trying to find product market fit, it's like the, um, obviously the, the, there's this moment in time at the beginning of the adoption cycle where people are rewarded for the vision and their belief and things of that nature. And I like just not knowing, um, too much about the economics of like triple a gaming. I was be curious for just, if you could just give us a little bit of uh, insight on that front, like what it costs to develop a great game and like what margins these companies run at. And I think we've talked a little bit about this before. It's like, it's such a, um, these things are so dependent on talent that are working for these enormous game studios and just have no idea what it costs to build these things and what these companies make. My impression though, is that it's kind of a, not necessarily a thin margin business, but it's definitely like um, a lot of it is done for love of the craft, right? Yeah, that that's definitely true. I mean, free to play games um, like a Fortnite, like an Angry Birds, typically don't make any profit for the first few years. Like all the money is going into development, and eventually they recoup it. But uh, a lot of people ask, like with with blockchain games, like you know games like Axie, like where does the money come from? And essentially, it's just a redistribution of where money is being transferred. So when you look at like uh, a block, when you look at a AAA game like Call of Duty, that game that that publisher Activision right is going to spend 
literally hundreds of millions of dollars to acquire users on marketing, on advertising, referrals, influencers, whatever. Mm -hmm. So in the future, if instead of the money going there to marketing expenses, it goes back to the player base and they essentially create like an affiliate marketing channel. Like that's, that's a big reason that, um, that money is going back to players. And I think that's, that's really positive for players, right? Instead of it going to a Super Bowl ad, it's going to the people who are actually using the product. The other piece that's important is the in-game economy, right? So when you buy a digital uh, skin in Fortnite, that money just goes to Epic Games, right? That's pure profit. It's a pretty wonderful business model. But in the future, maybe 30% of it goes to Epic and 70% of it goes to a pool that gets distributed back to the players. So people are putting their, their time, creativity, energy into these games. That's creating value. That value then going back to the players and not just to the publishers is, is kind of where the future lies. That's where the money is, is going back to the players. And, and that's what's so exciting and also why it's frustrating when a lot of people who are sort of core gamers um, criticize the space so hard because I think they're not thinking about their own self-interest. Like if they want to keep coughing up money to, to Ubisoft and Activision, they could. But if there's a better way and a better future where they actually like participate in a game's value um, and, and get some sort of equity in, in the game that they love. I think that's a, that's a much uh, more appealing scenario to be in. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think Jack, what, what you just said there kind of resonated with me around like the, the negative side to the incentive that you talked about is um, when that incentive goes away, where do those people go? Have they, been uh, convinced to stay so the equivalent in web 2 or whatever and sorry there's a loud siren outside I can't do much about uh, if you're hearing that on the audio um, it is uh, Uber or you know Uber we used to be able to share well you can still do it you share Uber with a friend refer a friend and you get like $15 off your next fare or whatever that's been going on forever and a lot of those brands um, I mean a lot of those apps that's been one of their biggest growth drivers and even before that uh, you mentioned affiliate there like a lot of traditional online businesses whether that's e-commerce or whatever 10 20 30 percent of their revenue often comes from affiliate as well so i think just reframing it like that was really uh, a smart way of of putting it but the key is once i've used uber you you've heard them talk about this once you've used uber twice you're there forever right because you've had that experience that magic moment you come out and you're like oh i didn't have to pay or whatever and i think what might be missing for a lot of these projects is they bring you in they give you the incentive which is great instead of it going to a marketing channel but then is there something there that's going to keep you there uh, and i just think of even something like looks rare like the nft platform that we've talked about on the show again i'm not the biggest nft person as it is so i'm not sure how that's doing compared to OpenSea and others but they did an amazing job of porting over people from OpenSea, and then after that i haven't felt even just as one user uh, much energy or much much of anything coming after that so i think that's a good and a bad thing for the space there's there's tools there for people to to lure people in but then it needs to ultimately be something valuable for people to stay um uh, one question I did have for you, Board, uh, just to wrap it up from my side, and I'll throw it over to you guys if you have anything else, is a lot of these uh, games, I'm curious, are they being built on Ethereum, I'm assuming? Because a lot of these need to be, um, you know, obviously smart contract based. Um, and I know Axie Infinity has Ronin for that reason. Like I've even got the Ronin wallet where you basically have no fees using that side chain or whatever. Uh, I know others are looking at Solana as another um, blockchain, which is much cheaper and faster. Um, I'm curious like what you're seeing from your point of view. Well, I heard Michael Saylor's building a Bitcoin backed uh, video game because that's the only <laughs> chain that, that uh, works. But uh, no, seriously. Um, <laughs> Wait, is that a I joke? Think- yeah, that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you could be. You never know. <laughs> promoting Bitcoin is the only video game Michael yeah. would like to play. <laughs> and he's uh, really good at it. He's winning. He's, he's very, very uh, good he's at the it. Top yeah. score, he's the top scorer. Yeah. The arcade leaderboard, machine says Top MS. leaderboard. Yeah. The top of leaderboard. 
But yeah, I mean, so with, with video games, you have a lot of transactions, a lot of activity, uh, and you don't want people spending money on, on gas. So uh, besides Ethereum, you're seeing uh, a couple other networks that are, that are growing in dominance. One is Polygon, which is like a side chain to Ethereum, Solana, which is a, a, a completely separate chain, and then Immutable X and Avalanche. Those are kind of the big five. Um, as I'm looking at sort of you know game studios, what they're building and considering making investments, those are the five that are really growing. And the way I'm looking at it is it's almost a platform the way like Xbox Live or the PlayStation Network or Nintendo Switch, like these are all different platforms and people are willing to use more than one platform. Like I have three consoles at home. I'll play on PC. I'll play on my mobile phone. Ideally, games will be interoperable or have cross play where you can play no matter what chain you're on. But um, basically like, you know, we're, we're sort of in the console wars right now. Like when it was Sega versus Nintendo, now it's Solana versus Polygon. And we're trying to figure out which ones are going to survive. And everything is just kind of a, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a ratio of security versus speed. So Ethereum network, super high security, very expensive and slow. Uh, Solana, you know, less security, really fast and cheap. So every game developer is kind of running through that equation and deciding where they want to invest right now. That's Got really it. interesting. Really love yeah. the framing of that. No, that makes a lot of sense, man. Yeah, I love the, you just wrote the title for us, man. Crypto Console Wars. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, any other questions from you guys? No, I'm good on that, man. That was amazing. Thank you for breaking down the Web3 Gaming Space board. I, I was just going to ask or add one thing. I think we we basically covered it, but it's just so the, like the dynamic of a financial market on top of an attention market is just like a really like the, the side effects of that are pretty fascinating. Like, especially when the games are by definition, like online, right? Like the, a, a lot of these require, um, well, all of them, I think that every example that I've seen require like reaching a critical mass of users. And if there's money to be made, like the, the challenge of keeping the attention of another user base when there's another game growing at a faster pace is just, just a really interesting um, incentive to switch for people, which means I think in the long term, the best product wins, but it's just such a violent and volatile process in getting there for that reason. And in the same way you see like NFT markets play out or any other like comparable asset thing, like the internet plus money plus uh, community network effects, that stuff just happens really violently and quickly. So um, yeah, not really and a question. I think when it, when it comes to attention, there's a big battle right now between social media and video games. A lot of people will spend four plus hours a day scrolling through social media and others will do that with video games. And if those are, if those two are in competition and one of them is fun, plus you get paid, even if it's a little bit, my hope honestly is that people switch to video games, which frankly is probably better for their mental state uh, and more productive. Um, unless of course, social media in the future also pays you, but that's I not exactly that, how it yeah. works. It's kind of the opposite, right? It's extracting value from you, whether it's money or attention. So I'm, I'm betting on video games being the, uh, the winner of that battle. Well, to yeah, your point, Twitter cool. is a game, right? Like it's a game. Like every, every morning you're not getting like a map, like Fortnite. We talked about it, but you're getting like the trending topic and you're trying to win with a meme or the funniest comment and get the engagement. It's a definitely a game. <laughs> yeah. And the analogy yeah, but- is the same, right? It's like mining a resource, like, the validators of an idea are like being rewarded for validating that idea somehow or like siphoning off some of the like value that's accrued at the platform level. But it does do really interesting things. We talked about BitClout three, four, five months ago, whenever that was like really hot. And it's just, uh, it's More not like the 12 same months as ago, man. Damn, we got... That was like, was that was like 10 months ago, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 83 years. It's been 83 years. It's it's been I think we talked about it in episode <laughs> zero, actually, which, by the way, I don't know if you guys have noticed, today is episode, I think, 52. So we're oh, officially... Shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, board, you, uh, had to, you had to be here for the anniversary, man. Uh, but yeah, I'm pretty sure we talked about it on uh, episode zero, which is kind of mad. That's kind of mad. Yeah. And I I think this, like, because all this stuff is so new, right? Like money being introduced to all of these things that it wasn't a part of for so long. Like people just don't really know what to do or how to like, how to um, 
behave. And I think the normalization of that will change that behavior. But right now it just results in like stuff that we haven't seen before. Like BitClout was, uh, I don't know, it's like it just turns into only fans in about three weeks. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Don't man. put that only fans, man. They're they're a killer business anyway. Um, all right. Well, that was an amazing uh, deep dive board. Thanks for going through all of that on the gaming side. I think we probably can do a nice little quick hitters to to wrap us up. Uh, I kind of had this frame for this last section we have. We're going to talk about a few kind of hot topics that are happening right now. Um, and but the question I have is like the direction of where crypto and um, Bitcoin specifically where it's kind of trending and kind of the culture of it because there was Bitcoin Miami, there was this big crypto haze uh, right up that I wanted to summarize and uh, also 8.5% inflation was just announced uh, in the last 24 hours. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna start by reading this one uh, that Jack had shared with us in the group chat as well. He said, the cost of living is up over 8% in the last year, but that's only if you're up that's only if you're using dollars. For those using and saving in Bitcoin, inflation is closer to 33% over that time frame. So I thought that was a great way to summarize the state that we're in and have a laugh about it because all jokes aside, is getting to a very concerning level. And you know, if you've been listening to this podcast for the year, you know, we've been talking about it, listening to other people talk about it for a long time. Sailors been going on crazy about it. Um, a lot winning of, the game, winning the game. Winning the game. And a lot of people are saying it's way above 8%. Like there's a decentralized inflation dashboard thing that I saw earlier, which again, who knows what that actually means, but that's closer to 13.5%. Um, we're all seeing it in our daily lives though, right? Like we know beyond um, the Russia implications, this was already happening. Now, if you add on top of that fuel um, and you know the price of food and all that stuff, we did a deep dive on a few episodes ago, things are getting at a very concerning level. Um, any thoughts from you guys on the inflation numbers? Oh, oh, my one thought was uh, I bought a bond me recently and it hit double digits. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. double digit bond me. What is going on here? My Vietnamese brother. That's maybe great. give me a little, give me a little bit less parsley and I'll pay 950 for that. But yo, that's when I hit. I'm like, oh, damn. How bond much me is a bond me where you are? Man? In New York, it's definitely hitting $10 yeah. plus. Oh, well, yeah. we, we had like seven and eight for ages, but now you're mm. getting that 10. I'm like that 10 spot for a bond me. Like you were like the, I could, I used to be able to trust you. I used to be able to trust you, Ben. <laughs> Mr. Bin. Uh, but it yeah, wasn't, it wasn't like a hipster joint where they're just marking it up. It was like the no, legit. No, it was like place. a legit, yeah, legit. They're like, no, no, the price has gone up. We actually need to maintain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm more than happy to pay my Vietnamese brothers a little, little uh, and sisters some extra cheddar for that. But that was when I'm like, okay, things are getting real. No, it's getting it's getting intense. Um, any thoughts from you guys, Board and Jack? I mean, I'll, I'll, Trung's probably feeling this in Canada, but I think uh, in a lot of major cities in the United States, uh, housing prices, pretty ridiculous. Inflation's hitting really hard there. Scarcity because people don't want to build more. And if they do want to build more houses, the materials are really expensive. Yeah. So if you're a young family, you know, looking to, uh, to expand your, your, your real estate or to buy your first home, uh, you're probably moving out of the cities and, and going to a place where it's a bit more affordable. Otherwise, you're you're spending $3 million for a shack. Yep. You just got to do the Jack Butcher clicks the bricks, man. You, yeah, you're all in. Eight, you're all <laughs> eight, uh, a standalone uh, a crib right there. Um, yeah, yes. we talked about it. It's just uh, not good, boys. That's my, that's my summary. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let, let, why don't we pivot to the Bitcoin Miami then? Because uh, yeah, I got yeah. a couple of thoughts on that. That's pretty related. <laughs> yeah, definitely is. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just a couple of takeaways that happy here. Anything you guys got from that? Because like, Jack went last year, right? Jack went to Miami last year. Yeah, you uh, didn't make it this I was, year. Uh, didn't make it this year. I have family in town, but um, next year, 2023, I'll be there. I You're think we got to do an NIA live there, man. Yeah, that's, man, we got to yeah, go. That's, that's true. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We that would be fun. So the, the kind of the big keynotes were uh, Peter Thiel. Uh, a couple of things he brought up that I found super interesting. I think our listeners will like if you didn't listen to it already. But uh, the most interesting point he brought up, I know that he called uh, uh, Warren Buffett a sociological grandpa. That wasn't the most interesting to me. Uh, the most interesting thing he brought up was uh, this chart of um, 
he was basically talking about how people should think about uh, Bitcoin and that they should not be thinking about it. Like, uh, you know how we uh, often compare it to gold? He's like, we, should, we need to stop thinking about it as gold and just think about it as a, in, the, in the investment space. And the example he brought up was that in, in January 1980, gold's market cap was $2.5 trillion and global equities were also $2.5 trillion. So they were at the same, uh, at the same level. 42 years later, global equities, $115 trillion. Gold is at $12 trillion. So his frame is, okay, let's think about Bitcoin, not can it become a $10 trillion asset, but could it potentially become the $100 trillion, $50 to $100 trillion where global equities are at? And that's an interesting frame. And that's, what, that's where actually his criticism of Buffett came up. He's basically saying guys like Buffett, old school money managers, uh, Jamie Dimon are connected to Wall Street, uh, the fiat world. They are obviously against it because they're just talking their own book the same way Teal is talking his book about Bitcoin. But like these money managers, they don't want to tell you, for you to realize that like, hey, listen, you don't need to like pick stocks. It's like, there's one investment. It's Bitcoin. It's as simple as that, right? And uh, and that's obviously Warren Buffett's shtick. He's the greatest stock picker ever. But if Bitcoin is going to be the best investment, you no longer need to be a stock picker. Um that's kind of like his position on how they think about it. I thought that was an interesting frame. It's like, stop thinking about Bitcoin as gold. Think about it just like a global equity and like that's its potential. And then the second one was our boy, Michael Saylor. Uh, this one's really short. Uh, he said a lot of things, but the ones that stuck out were, uh, he thought that uh, the recent executive order from the White House was a green light for Bitcoin and crypto. His logic was this. That was like the first time in his estimation that a government actually said in a document that all the agencies involved, the uh, commodities exchange features, uh, securities exchange, they need to start figuring out and educating themselves about Bitcoin. And they need to help America uh, innovate in that sector. And he said that there's never been a government edict from the US that said, figure out this asset class. And uh, to him, that is a green light. Um, obviously, a lot of that executive order was also like, let's stop people getting rugged. So like, there's also that side of it. But uh, yeah, that was Sailor's point uh, that uh, that it was a green light from the government. And the last thing he said was that the Lightning Network, which uh, Jack Mahler's from Strike, uh, announced all these partnerships with Shopify, these huge uh, payment networks. So it looks like Lightning's making a big move. We should probably break down Lightning in another episode, but uh, the Lightning le- Network for the listeners that don't know or viewers is uh, it's a layer two on top of Bitcoin. They basically bunch payments together uh, because right now you can only do like seven payments a second on Bitcoin. Uh, whereas a uh, visa is what are, I think it's like 40,000 payments a second, but uh lightning is supposed to kind of bridge that gap 4,000 transactions a second on visa. So uh, yeah, three, those are three takeaways uh, from Teal and two from sailor. Do you guys have anything? Yeah. Uh, the, I was going to come back to Jack Mauler's uh, the one last thing I was going to mention Tesla block block stream said they're teaming up to mine Bitcoin off solar power in Texas, which I thought was quite cool. Actually a really cool uh, initiative and like especially given how anti um bitcoin the environmental yeah. you know advocates are with proof of work being the main uh way that bitcoin works and being very energy intensive i thought that was an interesting you know like big players coming together tesla block alone you know the, our boys coming together for that the jack Beach. mauler's one i thought was very interesting so um I, my take on this was that I think it's an amazing step either way. I don't think it's a negative thing by any means. But my, as you guys have heard me say on the show all the time, like f- for this to get to hundreds of millions of people, there needs to be clear value add for the regular consumer. And this to me was more like a win for the merchants. Like they're going to get, but it's the benefits. They don't, really they don't have to pay the 3%, right? Exactly. That's all to the networks. Exactly. Yeah. So they're, they're going to gain from that. And yeah, you in a, in a, theoretical world maybe that pass you know that value is passed down to the consumer but in reality i doubt that's the case i think they just take another three percent for themselves a lot of the time um so I, i think the way it was positioned it felt like this big you know like moment and everyone you know has this expectation because jack mauler's is is the guy that uh announced the uh the stuff in the past with uh was it el salvador um and uh, did, did I say the right country, El Salvador? Yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah, El Salvador. Yeah. Um, 
and so yeah you know he's he's a legendary guy in the space i think he's doing really incredible work but to me it felt like this big hype everyone's like oh look at this big thing and i was a little bit like okay that's that's cool for the merchants but not necessarily the end user whereas the tesla b block thing coming together i thought was kind of a almost like a bigger deal and a bigger announcement in a way uh, but yeah, I'd love to get your take as well. On no, that. I will say that. So that's a great point regarding uh, Lightning Network because the he did frame it specifically as like the merchants have not had any innovation on their side in six yeah. seven years, right? It's like they're paying the exact same three percent to these networks that they've been paying since the sixties. Um, I think there are two pieces. Uh, well, one you mentioned is like, will they pass the fees on? That is one way potentially. We don't know. Maybe they will. The other two that might be a clear benefit. But again, there's going to be some education around it. It's interoperability because like Square Cash App is separate from PayPal, Venmo, right? Those are not, those are completely separate networks. And uh, you might be able to have a little bit more convenience uh, because Lightning is open. Um, and the other one is a physical finality. Like these cash transactions instantly close. You know, when you do stuff uh, in the old banking system, two, three days. But a part of that, I mean, that is actually, I think, a feature. That, that's huge. That, You're right. Yeah. That, 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 but that is a feature, not a bug, though, right? The reason why you have this leg, not necessarily that it has to be 48 to 70 hours, it's like it stops a lot of fraud. That's the reality. It's like that's what the chargebacks, like you can do chargebacks is because like there's this gap, right? Uh, a little bit I think, it's, I think that's true, but I think it's also because they're using batch processing from the 80s <laughs> using yeah. cobalt, uh, cobalt like language from like the 90s. My sister learned at university, but no, I, I agree. I do think there's a lot of really cool stuff coming from, from Lightning. Um, uh, the only other thing I was going to ask you guys is around you know, this narrative we've talked about since the beginning of the show of digital gold, Bitcoin, digital gold, it, you know. Um, and even like the reframing of Web3, like those have been the two best reframes for me in the last like, you know, five years anyway. And this to me was almost like a departure from that because we're now talking about using it like a currency, um, right? And right. and the joke is that most Bitcoiners don't want to spend their money because they're holding on to it, you know, under their pillow or whatever. No so it um, wants to be the pizza transaction, it, right? Exactly, well, that's exactly. The meme. Completely. So, yeah, I'm curious to you guys if you have any thoughts on like what with it being actual Bitcoin, which is a, has a price fluctuation. Um, could this actually be something people use for currency? And is that something that uh, that narrative is a positive thing for the space? I think. Yeah, I mean, the... I thought... Go on, boy. Okay. I was going to say, I, mean, I, th I think that the narrative that's going to hold true is that it is a, it is a storage of wealth. And it works really well there. And it works great if you already have wealth. If you have money, you should buy Bitcoin. A lot of young people in this country are graduating with debt, uh, have massive mortgages to pay. They don't have extra income to buy Bitcoin. And so that is why they're buying all these other things to basically help them amass wealth. Not saying that's a good strategy, but um, Bitcoin is basically fantastic if you're already rich. And then the move, if you're already rich, is you buy a bunch of Bitcoin you take a loan against it. You don't sell it. You just take a loan against it, spend that money, and then you die. And uh, that's that's the life cycle, right? That works yeah. really well. But but that that isn't appealing to like the average 28-year-old and the mover of culture. And so that's why they're gravitating to these other coins. But on the transaction front, I'm glad to see things like the Lightning Network. I'm glad to see all chains that are basically removing middlemen and removing fees that are hitting the average consumer, especially those who don't have a lot of money, things like overdraft fees, um, you know, transaction fees, all these things hurt people who have the, the least amount of money, right? Where, or, where losing like $40 to transaction fees is extremely expensive. So if those middlemen are eliminated um, in the long run, that is going to help the, the average person, uh, even if they don't feel it immediately. Yeah. Jack, you were going to say something as well there. Yeah, I, I, I like what you said, Borden. I think it's in, like the majority of people like pontificating about this are by global standards, very, very well off. So you're like, you're talking conceptually about this thing that, um, yeah, like you say, is, a, is more of a, or has even been positioned as a hedge for a lot of people. And that stat that Bilal brought up um, at the beginning of this segment, where you talk about like over, the, over a period of a year, it's not an it's not an inflation hedge, right? Over the period of half a lifetime, or a quarter of a lifetime, it's been proven to be that at least in its like existence to date. And I think the really like there's so many competing narratives where 
like Bitcoin as a, the, the most compelling explanation or the most compelling like future version or vision for Bitcoin for me is like the, uh, the, sp the sponge for value, right? Like the dom the denomination of everything. And I think sale has probably done the best job at articulating that in the most like profound way. But if that's, that's, I think where it gets comp like really confusing because obviously companies and like groups of people that build things that are valuable if that comes, if that becomes, uh, if that becomes a reality, then they're denominating the things they're building in Bitcoin, and they're charging for like. There's this whole layer of of uh, well, this this huge transition. I think people don't take into account where it's like this is a. It's not a currency in the same respect that there's like arbitrage between one country and another if this whole thing plays out it's like bitcoin absorbs the whole you know it's like um i don't know that i would i would definitely defer to sailor for the explanation but that narrative is also hurting the spending of it too because you th if you assume that this thing's going to absorb a hundred times more value in the next 10, 20, 30 years, you buying a t-shirt on Spotify for <laughs> however many decimal points is going to buy you, you know, uh, uh, a house in a few years. Um, so that's, I think that's, it's in a really tricky spot. And like you say, the actual, like the next leg up of the adoption cycle has to be a group of people that are going to use it in a different way. Or like, I guess the other way to come at it is like, these institutional shifts in thinking like a Dorsey and a Musk and like people who really like set culture and financial culture at scale say like, okay, we're a Bitcoin only or Bitcoin first company. And then that, that, you know, this, those are the two ends of the spectrum. And I think there's probably more um, likelihood of that narrative taking hold if the bigger players do it rather than like, you know, us going around one by one and saying like, Hey, can you gamble your paycheck on this? And then <laughs> this loaf of bread is yeah. going to cost you either one X or two X or 2.5 X or half. I, like most people are just not like there needs to be a level of sp stability achieved. And I think that, um, has to come from like behemoth level of adoption. And I don't know what's going on in El Salvador. I've heard like real mixed reports of the reception of, the reserve currency. I don't know if it's a mandate, but obviously um, the yeah, the average net worth in El Salvador is very different than the States or Canada or um, a lot of other first world countries. And yeah, I think it's just uh, it's such a bizarre social experiment, right? Nobody's, this has just never happened before. So people are just like coming up with explanations that fit the narrative that they've either, you know, bought into or had sailor convinced them of. But I think you also can't ignore. Well, I think it's like the people who have the most interesting perspective on it have achieved this level of wealth where they have this like philosophical breadth. They can zoom out and look at things from like a really um, different perspective than somebody who's, either living paycheck to paycheck yeah, or has to be very careful about how they yeah, spend like, money. Which is most people. Yeah. So yeah, I like, but everything we've discussed on this podcast, I think like we're just in a time of like incredible volatility. And this is a, you know, this is a, like an interesting side quest or side plot that's going on against this backdrop of everything else going pretty, being pretty bizarre. Yeah. I think you, you just said that Jack about, uh, like we've just started talking about 8.5% inflation rate where everyone's going to the supermarket and being like, oh my God, the loaf of bread is up or the petrol is up or whatever. Imagine then having the fluctuations of a price going up. I went in for a pint of milk yesterday and it was X amount and now it's X minus 50% or whatever. Or like th there's a reason like there are people building stable coins and you can you know argue the benefit pros and cons of that. Uh, but the truth is to get, in my opinion anyway, to get hundreds of millions of people to use this thing, you're going to need that on-ramp. You're going to need to bring people and say, you're basically using dollars, but it, it happens to be doing some other stuff in the back end that you don't need to care about. Obviously, you don't say that to people, but it's just going to work. In the same way, and again, I don't know enough about Terra, but 
from Mario's piece anyway in The Generalist. I remember him writing this about how they proactively went and basically created deals with people and said like Nike and retailers and the equivalent of Disneyland use our stable coin in your park and you're going to be rewarded similar to Lightning Network with you know basically instant payments it's going to clear straight away and the fees are going to be less and that just drives adoption of something where people don't even realize they're using it because it's just the rails which is actually probably the boring part but the part that's actually going to work for most you know, if it actually ever gets to a certain scale that people say it will do one day, it's going to be that boring stuff, a lot of it. So, um, yeah, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm, one other thing I did want to bring up, um, Trung, you said this in our chat. Um, there was a clip going around. You guys have probably seen it from the Bitcoin Miami conference. The dude's on stage and they said, who here has Ethereum in the crowd? And like, what was it, like 80, 90% of people in the crowd put their hand up. But you could see some of them getting shy and being like, oh no, I shouldn't be putting my hand up like a kid at school when you've uh, realized you, you got baited in. And uh, yeah, I, I guess to wrap it up, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on kind of the culture of that, right? Which is, in my opinion, like, obviously that's Bitcoin maxis, not anyone, like we all like Bitcoin, I'm sure, but none of us are, are maxis in that way. Um, but to me, anyway, this culture of like maximism uh, or maximalism, sorry, is just like such a huge deterrent. Like actually one of the reasons I didn't especially want to go because I'm like, I don't know if I want to be around a bunch of Bitcoin maxis, which is probably overgeneralizing. But yeah, curious what you guys think on, uh, on, on that clip in particular and in general, the wider lens of the culture of it. I think it's probably been true for the like duration of the, I mean, I've been there in person and I'd say 80, 90% of people are like interested in technology. Right. And maybe some of them crossed over into like, this is the only answer, but after, especially the last year or two, like the things that are going on in other ecosystems, if you were drawn to Bitcoin in the first place, I can't imagine that the things that are happening in those worlds aren't interesting to you. hundred um, percent. Yeah. And that like, even as a, even as a participant that buys a different version of the narrative, I think it's just the bizarre thing to me is like innovation can't happen outside of this construct it just feels like a bizarre belief system to me um in the same way that you like wouldn't write off like a private company that's building something specific um it feels like you're missing out on a lot outside of uh outside of this ecosystem and um if this i think the the really the the bizarre thing about it is like if a lot of the narrative that has been propagated is true, then all of this innovation will fold into this like master system at a certain point. I don't know. I don't, I, I mean, to ignore nuance is just not a very interesting way to live in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and, I just and, feel and, like, and what, uh, it, sorry, my last point was just going to be, I saw a few tweets on this. It's like, what else are you talking about? Like at, after like three or four years of, the narrative i think um well you're gonna start talking about eagles on a cliff that's what happens is you gotta find yeah. this stuff to talk about <laughs> yeah it's 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 yeah the like the narrative is definitely just getting weaker because it it can't latch on to culture in the same way that we've seen um other areas Ethereum, like web NFTs. three the web three narrative is just like vertical right like i think people can see themselves in where in some version of web three because of the for good or bad like the broadness of the term and the like the capacity of the buzzword to basically hold like crypto as the rails for any kind of business any kind of product any kind of um like solving all sorts of different problems to me is just has been a much better meme for attracting people to the, the crypto sphere yeah i was gonna say i mean one of the things that I always use to judge someone's intelligence is their ability to change their mind when presented with information. And I think any kind of maximalism, whether it's religion, politics, brands that you support or cryptocurrencies, like if you have to work so hard to convince other people to want to use it, maybe there are downsides, or at least you have to consider that you are 
implying that there are downsides. Um, politics is such a good example because I feel like so much of at least what happens in the United States is people bashing the other side and what, for why they're bad instead of talking about why you are good. So, you know, I'm, I'm a supporter of Bitcoin. I own it. I love it. But like, I just talk about why it's good. I don't necessarily spend time or you know, waste time bashing the other coins. Right. If my, if my product is the best, then I'm just going to, I'm going to focus on that. Um, and also just like when it comes to conferences, I either go to learn something new or to network with people, not to, uh, not to be in a cult. So I don't know. People <laughs> yeah, have different priorities. Definitely. So I'll see you in Miami 2023 is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, a- <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring an iPad with you on it, boy. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Thank you. I don't, whoever, yeah, I, I don't want to, I don't want to decide who gets to hold the iPad, but uh, I, I'm looking forward to being there with you virtually. Love it. Um, Trunk, anything from you before we wrap up, mate? No, I think uh, every, everything I was going to say, Jack hit it uh, perfectly. Just Perfect. the, the, you can't keep going back. It's the same narrative. So I, 100%. I agree. All right. And just to wrap it Miami up. Miami here was just end the podcast with the same segment every week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the last thing I was going to say, we won't have time to talk too much about it, but I will say uh, I shared in our Telegram and I uh, chat. So you can click that in the YouTube or the show notes below and join that if you're not already in there. Uh, There were two articles, recent ones, from Crypto Hayes, who is a controversial figure because he was the founder or CEO of BitMEX, got in a little bit of trouble. Uh, But if you read his writing, he's, you know, I tried to separate um, uh, the person or what's happened because I don't actually know too much about it with what he's writing about. I think he's a really smart, interesting writer. He wrote two things recently. One was called Five Ducking Digits, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's about Ethereum, essentially um, a price target of $10,000 or more. And um, the Q trap, which was the recent one, which has been going around, people have been, um, which is more of a bearish case on also prices, but he really breaks down, for example, that Bitcoin and Ethereum are highly correlated to the NASDAQ. And, uh, you know, contrary, you know, um, contrary to the, the other narrative of it being digital gold, and you know in, in a high inflation environment we haven't necessarily seen uh you know that narrative play out in the way that we would potentially like um and it really shows it's more c- correlated to these growth stocks that we all own google facebook tech stocks and it kind of makes sense right it's a form of technology and it's based on usage and network effects and all those things and, and narrative of something being more valuable in the future so it makes sense that's being traded like that but he really breaks it down with with charts and stuff like that um, so I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. Um, so th- the interesting thing is here, like all predictions, there's one which is very bearish and one which is very bullish. One is saying Bitcoin's going down to 30K, Ethereum down to 2,500. And then the other one saying Ethereum is going up to 10K. And he's put, I think, 80% of his, his portfolio into ETH now. So um, definitely worth checking out. And um, yeah, anything else, guys? Not bef- investment no, advice. Definitely not investment advice. But I think it's, I do like that he gives like, actual numbers versus just yeah. saying things are going up or down and uh, he's a smart dude either way so I, I think it's worth checking out um board thanks for joining us today man this has been really really fun um anything else before we wrap up no that was beautiful no, I, it was it was a pleasure hanging out with you guys um perhaps the next time we'll be in miami but in the meantime we'll shit talk each other on twitter 100 percent, man love it man thanks for joining us and as always thanks for being here and uh, we love you guys and appreciate everything you're doing to spread the word, joining us in the group chat. There's a lot of jokes in there, man. I have to say every few days I'm messaging the boys saying, man, like the people in here are legitimately funny. Like they're making jokes, dropping memes and all that sort of stuff, roasting each other, roasting us. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah. make sure you join us in there for the fun. And uh, as always, we'll see you in the next one next week. Cheers. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Guys. Yeah.